You probably know that high blood pressure is dangerous for your heart, but did you know that it's also dangerous for your brain? And it's not just about strokes either. High blood pressure is one of the most significant risk factors for dementia. But here's the troubling fact. What we thought was once a healthy blood pressure may actually be doing harm and it needlessly raises our risks of cognitive decline. So in this video, we'll explore a brand new study that gives us fresh evidence that we need to lower our blood pressure by more than we thought. We'll also look at what the new target blood pressure should be according to this research. And if you want weekly health research summaries and health strategies that I share with my patients, click the link in the pinned comment below. So let's unpack something I said that might sound surprising, that high blood pressure is a key risk factor for dementia. So what evidence do we have for that connection? Well, one cohort study in Hawaii included almost 4,000 men. Scientists checked their blood pressure in middle age and then looked for signs of dementia 20 years later. They found a strong association between midlife blood pressure and dementia in old age. Those with high blood pressure when they were younger had nearly five times the risk of dementia compared to those with a normal blood pressure. Researchers in Finland found a similar result. Once again, patients had their blood pressure checked in middle age and were assessed for dementia when they were older. Those with elevated blood pressure had 2.3 times the risk of dementia later in life. There's even evidence that elevated blood pressure in early adulthood leads to signs of cognitive decline by midlife. So the clinical evidence points to a definitive link between blood pressure and dementia. And we're going to look at the new study soon, which gives us important new details. But first, why is there a link? What is behind this connection? Well, the brain requires a large amount of blood to supply oxygen and energy. It's filled with blood vessels, many of which are tiny and sensitive. Elevated blood pressure puts stress on the whole system, causing several problems at once. It damages blood vessels, increases inflammation, and generates oxidative stress, which accelerates neuron aging. Plus, as the body responds to this damage over time, our blood vessels get stiffer and can form plaques. And that just makes the problem worse. As we age, our brains lose the ability to adjust to higher blood pressure and repair that damage. This accumulated damage to the brain is one of the root causes of dementia. And that's why studies often look at blood pressure in midlife. Brain damage from high blood pressure, it doesn't appear immediately. The body has mechanisms to temporarily guard the brain against the effects of high blood pressure, but over time, significant damage accumulates. That's why we can't wait until we're diagnosed with dementia to do something about high blood pressure. Prevention is always better than treatment. The time to address it is now. The younger, the better. And that leads to a critical question. When it comes to blood pressure, how high is high? What level is safe? Well, two groundbreaking studies have completely changed the answer to this question. These studies show that doctors got it wrong. For decades, we knew that high blood pressure was dangerous, but we didn't realize just how dangerous it was, even at levels that seemed okay. For a long time, doctors believed that having a systolic blood pressure, so that's the top level on the reading, up to 140 was perfectly fine. And you may have even heard your doctor say that as long as your blood pressure is under 140 on 90, you're in the clear. We used to think that while 120 on 80 is ideal, but 140 should be okay. But now we know that having a systolic blood pressure near 140 is actually risky. It's not just okay, it's putting our lives at risk. The reason doctors thought that 140 was fine is that blood pressure, it tends to go up as we age. So they figured that a little bit higher was normal. But new research shows that even a little bit of extra pressure causes significant problems. The first wake-up call came from the SPRINT study, which stands for Systolic Blood Pressure Intervention Trial. This study was massive, involving over 9,000 participants, so the findings are difficult to ignore. The goal was to see if lowering blood pressure to below 120 would protect against heart attacks, strokes, and other problems. Problems better than using the older target of 140. The people in the study were at high risk of heart disease, but they didn't have diabetes or a history of strokes. They were split into two groups. One aimed for a blood pressure of 140, while the other one aimed for less than 120. Now here's where it gets really interesting. The results were so clear that they had to stop the study early. The study was supposed to last for four to six years, but after just 3.3 years, it was obvious that lowering blood pressure to below 120 made a huge difference. There was a 27% lower risk of having heart attacks strokes or dying from these causes each year. And when it came to death rates alone, there was a 25% lower risk of dying in the group that aimed for a blood pressure of 120. So let that sink in for a moment. A 25% reduction in the risk of death just by lowering blood pressure more aggressively. This isn't a small improvement, it's a game changer. 
But the story doesn't stop there. Recently, another study in China tested these findings over an even larger and more diverse group, over 11,000 people, and it included those with diabetes and those who had already had a stroke. Think of this study as the sequel to the SPRINT study, but with an even bigger cast. And guess what? The results were just as powerful. Lowering systolic blood pressure to less than 120 reduced the risks of heart attacks, strokes, and death from cardiovascular causes by 12%. Plus, it cut the overall risk of death from any cause by 21% over the three and a half years. The takeaway is clear. The old normal of 120 is no longer good enough. Most of us should aim for a systolic blood pressure of less than 120 to protect our health. But these studies focused on heart attacks, strokes, and all-cause mortality. What about dementia risk? Do we know anything about the safe blood pressure for that? And thanks to this new study, we now do. The study is actually a follow-up analysis of the group that was used in the SPRINT study that we looked at earlier. But in this new analysis, researchers looked at the risks of developing dementia. Would they find the same pattern that they did for heart attacks and strokes? Well, the pattern was the same. Those who were given a lower blood pressure target had a 14% lower chance of developing dementia dementia during the follow-up period. That is a significant finding. Another study adds one more piece of evidence that points in the same direction. It found that middle-aged women with a blood pressure of between 120 and 139 had increased evidence of cognitive decline a decade later. The researchers suggest to reduce our blood pressure to below 120 to reduce our risks of cognitive decline. And all of this gives us strong evidence that getting our blood pressure below 120 isn't just the right target for our hearts, it's the right target for our brains too. So what can we do to lower our blood pressure to a healthy level? Well, here are some of the most important actions we can take. One of the simplest is to reduce our salt intake. The American Heart Association recommends that we should have no more than about half a teaspoon or 1,500 milligrams per day. Compare that to the 3,500 milligrams that the average American consumes daily. But how significant is sodium intake? Well, one study looked at 85 different trials and it found a clear pattern. As sodium intake goes up, so too does blood pressure. The reason is simple. Sodium causes our body to retain more water, increasing the volume of our blood. So if there's a greater amount of fluid in your blood vessels, it makes sense that the pressure would increase. It's similar to the way a balloon stretches tighter and tighter as we blow more air into it. A salt substitute is also a good option for some people. The second thing we can do to control our blood pressure is shift the way we eat. Researchers have developed guidelines called the DASH diet, which stands for Dietary Approach to Stop Hypertension. And as you can guess from the name, it's specifically designed to lower blood pressure. One analysis looked at several types of interventions to lower blood pressure, and it concluded that the DASH diet might be the most effective way to lower blood pressure without medications. The DASH diet is simple. Choose vegetables, fruits, low-fat dairy, whole grains, chicken, fish, and nuts while minimizing the consumption of sweets, sugary drinks, and red meat. It's high in fiber, high in lean protein, and it's packed with nutrients. As an added bonus, when we follow the DASH diet, we're more likely to increase our potassium intake by increasing potassium-rich foods like spinach, bananas, peas, and beans. But why is this a bonus? Well, because potassium helps to lower our blood pressure. It balances out sodium levels while encouraging the walls of our blood vessels to relax. Its powerful effect is the reason why I included it in microvitamin. But just because I take a supplement does in no way mean that you should as well. The third key strategy to lower our blood pressure is adding exercise. Now, I know how hard it can be to get started, especially if you've been relatively inactive. The good news is that even small changes can make a positive impact. I encourage my patients to look at ways that they can incorporate exercise into their schedules, so I recommend that they try exercise snacks. They're short bursts of physical activity that you can sprinkle throughout your day, like mini workouts instead of one big training session. So instead of carving out a 30-minute time to go to the gym, you might consider a few sets of wall squats between meetings for example. So I do exercise snacks during my 15 minute paperwork break at the clinic. Finally, for overweight individuals, weight loss can be a powerful contributor to getting elevated blood pressure under control. One study found that the greater the weight loss, the greater the reduction in blood pressure. And though losing weight can be challenging, the changes that we've already talked about so far can make it much easier. But if our weight is still above target, despite optimizing our lifestyle factors, we can consider medications like Ozempic, which can help on our weight loss journey. And taking medication isn't a failure, it's just another tool to help us reach our health goals.
And if our lifestyle factors are dialed in, our weight is perfect, but we still have a blood pressure of above 120, then I have a discussion with my patients about the pros and cons of medications. I emphasize that medications should be an addition to, never a replacement for, other steps. But while medications are sometimes necessary, most of us want to avoid it if possible. So how much can we really lower our blood pressure naturally without taking medications? Well, in this next video here, I'll show you what's possible and walk you through the steps that we can take, including the exact exercise research that shows us how we can reduce our blood pressure the most. 